Welcome, Dr. Edgar. And in this lecture, we're going to talk about chocolate pots, American pyramids, the black drink of Mississippi, the original art of Texas, and the morning wars of North America. We're going to follow that outline right up above my head, and we are going to talk about the native nations of North America. And all of this is to provide you with enough information to answer that question right there. Explain the geological and biological factors that made Native Americans vulnerable to deadly, virulent pathogens. What did Native American groups need to do, need to acquire to survive? Explain why groups that welcomed outsiders survived while exclusionary groups did not. Did Native America collapse on its own or was it destroyed? Did Europe kill 40 million people? Now, as we move to the complex societies of North America, we need to understand a couple things. I really can't give you a full description of all the Native American societies, even the ones that were really quite complex. And in my description, it's going to seem, you know, really atomized, like there's a group here, and there's the Mississippians over there, and the Iroquoians over there. But in reality, as you can see with this map, all of these Native American societies were connected. They were directly connected to their neighbors, and they were connected to uh, more distant societies through vast networks of trades, of roads, of traces, of routes, that all kind of snaked across the landscape and connected Cahokia with Chaco Canyon and Chaco Canyon to the societies of Central America and the, the Mississippian kingdoms with the Iroquoian societies around the Great Lakes, that all of these societies were to some extent interconnected to one another, and they're really kind of not as atomized as they first appear or as we first thought they were. Now, while we do have these very complex societies of Central and South America, we also have fairly complex societies in North America. We've got several of them. We've got Chaco Canyon, we've got Cahokia, we've got the Mississippian Kingdoms, we have the Eastern Woodland Groups. And let's start with Chaco Canyon. Probably one of the more striking, and, and certainly the ruins that Chaco Canyon left are extremely striking, one of the more striking Native American civilizations that you can see. Chaco Canyon is located in the American Southwest, and it prospered roughly between 900 and 1350. This was part of the ancestral Puebloan society. And Chaco Canyon was a state, or at least from my uh, reading of the literature, it certainly looks like a kingdom to me. And it was quite a large kingdom as well, uh, pretty much existing, you know, between Flagstaff and Albuquerque, right across the Four Corners region of, of Utah, Arizona, Colorado, and New Mexico. It was quite large, all centered on this main garden oasis city of Chaco Canyon. Now, modern archaeologists have called this sort of large area, this kingdom of Chaco Canyon, they've called it the Chaco Sphere. And one of the more interesting things about the Chaco Sphere is you can tell from the map on the upper left, there are actually a series of roads that sort of spoke outwards from Chaco Canyon itself, connecting the main sort of city of Chaco uh, to these more sort of distant communities and these distant great houses scattered uh, across the entire Chaco sphere. The other thing I want to stress to you about Chaco Canyon is Chaco Canyon is quite clearly connected to the really complex societies down in Central America, you know, the Aztecs, the Maya, and their predecessors. And we know this because we have direct connections uh, between Chaco Canyon and these Southern societies. We have materials from Central America that have been found at Chaco Canyon, including materials found in those vessels right there on the lower left. Those are chocolate pots. They were recovered from a tomb at Chaco Canyon, and they contained chemical evidences of theobromium, which is the active ingredient in chocolate. Chocolate does not grow in the American Southwest. So for chocolate to be there, it had to have been imported from regions to the south, central or southern Mexico even. And we have more than just uh, chocolate pots that connect Chaco Canyon uh, to Central America. There are macaw bones, there are, there's the presence of turquoise down in southern Mexico, which turquoise, which might be from Mexico, it might also be from New Mexico, from the Four Corners region. Uh, right up above. But clearly Chaco Canyon is in contact with these southern areas, maybe following, you know, a ve the very famous Chaco Meridian. You know, as you walk directly south, you'll end up in central Mexico. The other thing I want to stress is Chaco Canyon itself. Uh, I've been kind of dancing around the issue of like, what exactly is Chaco Canyon? Chaco Canyon 
was a kind of a garden city. It was actually located in a canyon. That, there's, a, there's a Google image map of it, and, and it contains these incredibly picturesque ruins of these huge, great houses. But you look at these maps and you look at these photographs and they're all very brown and gray and beige and tan. Uh, but in antiquity, Chaco Canyon didn't look like that. It was a brilliant green place because the inhabitants of Chaco Canyon, the ancestral Puebloan people, actually built a dam at the edge of, of one of the canyons and they created this huge reservoir. And then they used that reservoir to irrigate areas all along the canyon and to irrigate the, so the areas on the sides of the canyon. So. Chaco Canyon in antiquity would have been bright green. It would have been brilliant green. You would have trees, fruit trees, reds, yellows, oranges, and the sides of Chaco Canyon would have been covered in cornfields with the three sisters, corns, beans, squash, all along the sides. And inside the canyon, you have these great houses, these enormous structures with hundreds of rooms, some that are sometimes three, four stories high, containing these circular kiva chambers, these, these ritual chambers. And then in between all the great houses, you would have had sort of more humble single family dwellings scattered along the entire length of Chaco Canyon. And we know that Chaco Canyon was importing wood from nearby mountains, ceramics from elsewhere, chocolate from Central America. This is a complex society and it existed for, you know, three or 400 years. Now, the end of Chaco is heavily disputed. We actually don't know how Chaco Canyon fell apart, but there are indicators that when the Chaco sphere collapsed, it was a really violent collapse uh, and it went down really hard. And there's uh, lots of instances of violence uh, in the archeology span of the ancestral Pueblo and people. So we have these ruins of Chaco Canyon, this great civilization, and if you're ever passing through that area of New Mexico, I would highly recommend a visit to this ancient American civilization. Moving much to the east, we have, you know, the big rival, uh, the contemporary of, not rival, the contemporary of Chaco Canyon, which is Cahokia. Cahokia itself is a, a massive city. It's much larger than Chaco Canyon. Cahokia is located uh, across the Mississippi from St. Louis. It's across the city and slightly to the north. It's directly on the Mississippi River. And uh, Cahokia dominated a huge area. It probably wasn't a capital city uh, like Chaco Canyon was. It was probably more of a religious center. It was less of sort of imperial Rome with the head of the big Roman Empire. And it was probably medieval Rome, which didn't control that huge an area, but it had lots of cultural, ritual, and religious influence throughout a broad region. And that broad region is probably in the orange right up above my head. That is the Middle Mississippian civilization. This scattered collection of, of, of towns that stretch all the way from Wisconsin to Florida, from Texas, all the way to Georgia. And Cahokia itself is this really impressive place. Uh, it was, it, it, its religious significance is evidenced in all of the pyramids that it has, American pyramids in central Illinois. And the largest pyramid is right there on the lower left, Monk's Mound itself, constructed out of rammed earth. And in antiquity, Monk's Mound probably would have looked like that over there. This huge elaborate structure with more perishable wooden and thatch buildings on top, a great area for the display of ritual power, ritual significance, and religious fervor. Uh, right up above me is a map of downtown Cahokia itself, and you get some sort of idea of the scale of this city. It was really an impressive place. And it wasn't just confined to the downtown area. If you look at the insert right there, you'll see that it was along this entire bend of the Mississippi River, a, a geological feature known as the American Bottom, that you have not just Cahokia, but a large number of satellite towns, suburbs, and more distant villages all inside the periphery of Cahokia. And they found uh, re Cahokia related religious imagery all over the place. You have, you know, religious specialists, shaman who are in the, tran who are in the middle of tra transforming themselves into birds. You have warriors holding decapitated heads up on the upper left. Cahokia was a really impressive place in its heyday with priests, a priest class. You even had these things called wood hinges huge pyramids and walled compounds, and it also had an elaborate trade network. People went to Cahokia not just seeking religious 
you know, religious fervor or not just on pilgrimage, but they often went there to trade. And one of the more interesting things about Cahokia is it had to have been accompanied by kind of these, these kind of market type things. And there's one pictured on the upper left because Cahokia has all of this mixture of stuff, copper from Wisconsin, marine shell from Louisiana, alligators from Florida, deer from South Carolina. All of these things are flowing towards Cahokia, being exchanged by the people there as either part of their pilgrimage or part of their religious ceremony or part of their confirmation ceremony or whatever. Or whatever. The, the religion of the Mississippians is this really complicated thing that we'll discuss in just a tick. But Cahokia was a really, really impressive place. Now, Cahokia itself collapses in the 15th century for reasons that are very unknown, very mysterious. Um, it did probably did not go down hard like Chaco Canyon did. We've got all these like all this warfare in the archaeological record. And probably the best argument for the collapse of Cahokia is probably some catastrophic flood, one of these like thousand year floods that like Hurricane Katrina style just like completely wrecked the city. As Cahokia collapses, the successors of Cahokia are the late Mississippian civilization of the American South. And you can see uh, from the map there on the lower left, uh, late Mississippian civilization was widely scattered, again, all the way from Texas to Georgia, from Florida to Wisconsin. And all of these green icons are different towns of the Mississippian civilizations scattered all over the place, each of these little towns being to some extent, a reflection of the glory of Cahokia, which is abandoned by, by this time. And the late Mississippians are there in the 16th and 17th century. And in fact, it is the Mississippians that the Spanish invaders uh, like De Soto and Narvaez uh, will encounter later on. So let's actually take a look at what the Mississippians actually looked like. Now, the Mississippians lived in these dense walled towns. And you can sort of see artists' depictions of what these walled towns look like. Uh, this is a depiction of a site, uh, I believe it's in Georgia, called Itoa. And, and you can quite easily see it. It's got these sort of earthen pyramids, you know, that are reflections of Monk's Mound, you know, these distant, distant mirrors of, of Cahokia uh, inside these very fortified uh, downtown areas. And Itoa has not only a moat, but as you see that image over there, I mean, not only a wall, but Itoa actually has a moat and then a series of satellite farmsteads all around it. So the Mississippians lived in these very dense, heavily fortified walled towns. And all around their walled towns, they had these extensive cornfields with the three sisters, corns, beans, squash. And then further afield, you would have had hundreds of acres of dense forest that would have been a very carefully managed hunting preserve. Because of, remember, if you have a primarily corn-based diet, you have to supplement this with animal flesh. So one of these sort of arch-typical Mississippian kingdoms would have had a walled town in the center. Surrounding it would have been extensive cornfields and farmsteads. And then around that would have been this really large hunting area that is for that kingdom only. And inside that, that hunting preserve would have been these carefully managed populations of deer and bear and elk and whatever else they had. Because to manage those, to manage the game animals is to manage their own health. And these are really interesting and very, very complicated uh, kingdoms. Uh, and we've only recently, only in the last few decades, have we really kind of come to the realization of exactly how complex Mississippian civilization really was. Now, when I took American history, you know, many decades ago, you know, they just kind of, you know, hand waved away these, these Indians. Yeah, they lived in villages and they were these chiefs and they grew corn. But it's really only been in, since the 1990s that we have this deep appreciation of just how complex Mississippian civilization was. It was a really complex civilization that certainly seems the equal, if not the rival of, of really the really big civilizations down in Central America. They had an incredibly complex cosmology. They had stunning, beautiful uh, works of ritual art. They had complex political organization. And, you know, if I had to do archaeology all over again, I'd probably go Mississippians because the Mississippian civilization is intensely complex and incredibly fascinating. Now, but it wasn't, as you can probably tell from the fortified towns 
everything wasn't, you know, sunshine and roses for the Mississippians because the Mississippians were into warfare. They were into warfare like nothing was into warfare. They had these sort of warrior cults and this, this cosmological uh, this cosmological ceremonial complex, which is called the Southeastern Ritual Ceremonial Complex. Uh, I like it much better by its much older name, the, what they called it in the 60s and 70s, the Southern Death Cult. And anyway, had these warrior societies, and these were really ferocious societies of, of young men who would go out and prove themselves by making war on their neighbors. I mean, those walls around the town weren't for, just for show. And we have this reflected in some of the iconography. There is a warrior over there. He's in the process of, of transforming into a bird. He's heavily armed. Uh, here is a, a European depiction of one of the war parties of one of these Mississippian states, one of these kingdoms getting ready to declare war on their neighbors. And the Mississippians had something that very much aided them in warfare, something that is kind of mysteriously known as the black drink. Now, what was the black drink itself? The black drink itself was a holly berry made from the hollies. It was uh, Ilex vomitorium, and it was served in special ritual cups, just like that. And the black drink, you would drink it, you would then throw up, and then you would hallucinate wildly. You wouldn't feel tired. You would feel almost no pain. You would feel as if you were in an altered state of consciousness where you didn't feel fear. You didn't get tired and you, you know, you couldn't be hurt. Well, you could be hurt. You just wouldn't feel it. And it was known that ingesting the black drink was part of the war ceremony, part of the ceremony of going to war. You, you guzzle the black drink, you vomit, and then suddenly you have a hundred angry young men who don't get tired, don't think they're in real life, and don't feel pain. The black drink is a major asset when it comes time for the Mississippian kingdoms to fight the Spanish Empire. Now, here in East Texas, we have a, a kind of Mississippian group. Uh, in East Texas, we have the Caddo Nation. And the Caddo Nation was once considered part of Mississippian civilization, but this has been challenged in recent years, and, and I find the challenge to be a very convincing argument. And the argument is that the Caddo Nation is not an extension of Mississippian civilization, but is rather an indigenous tradition native to East Texas that simply imported many of the attributes and many of the qualities of Mississippian civilization and not others. It, like they had the black drink, but the, as we'll see, the Caddo were, really weren't into warfare. And uh, here in East Texas, there were a number of these, these large Caddo kingdoms. And the nearest one is, of course, the spectacular site of Caddo Mounds, which was probably one of these sort of Caddo towns, uh, probably resembled one of these Mississippian towns. But the Caddo towns were not uh, fortified uh, because the Caddo really weren't into the kind of warfare and warrior cults, the southern death cults, uh, that the other that the more sort of mainstream Mississippian civilizations were into. But they were into the hunting. And there is, in fact, a natural ridge that runs just south, just south of the Sabine River uh, that, would have, that was an, an excellent spot to place your hunting camp. And it's, if it's a ridge, it's very solid. It overlooks these big forests. And if you're going to go hunting, that's a perfect place to put a camp. But it's also a perfect place to put an interstate. And they put I-20 right along the top of this ridge, which is why whenever they expand the road or add an on-ramp or an off-ramp or, or, you know, widen the road, they hit... Uh, Caddo artifacts. There's Caddo hunting sites all along the forests of East Texas. And uh, for work crews to sort of cut into one of these Caddo hunting camps is, is not uncommon at all. And because the Caddo Nation is indigenous to East Texas, it has a unique historical position in American history. Now, uh, the Caddo Nation is a, a really, really interesting group of people. Uh, you can see on the map on the upper left, this is a rough map of the various sort of Caddo polities, the Caddo kingdoms as they existed, based along these rivers and primarily centered on the, the Middle Red River. And uh, the Caddo nations lived in these sort of dispersed towns. They weren't concentrated and fortified uh, like the sort of mainstream Mississippian towns. Uh, but they had a more dispersed pattern surrounded by cornfields, and the cornfields were surrounded by these massive uh, hunting grounds with these, these managed populations of deer. 
And the archaeology of the Caddo is incredibly interesting. And I highly recommend uh, reading some of the texts on the Caddo. They're really interesting. Now, one of the more unusual things about the Caddo is that the Caddo called their land uh, Taisha, and I'm almost certainly mispronouncing that. And when the survivors of, of De Soto's expedition come through East Texas in the 16th century, they take refuge among the Caddo in these sort of dispersed Caddo towns. And they ask the Caddo, like, what is this area? And the Caddo say, well, this is, this is the land of friends. Because again, the Caddo aren't into kind of formal Mississippian warfare. So this is the land of friends where, you know, one Caddo can walk from one side of the Caddo nation to the other side of the Caddo nation, relatively unmolested. And the Caddo word for friend is Taisha or Taisha. You can see right up above it. So this is the Caddo, land, the Caddo nation in the land of Taisha. And eventually the Spanish survivors make it back to Mexico and the area starts showing up on Spanish maps as the great kingdom of Tejas, because that is how the Spanish heard the Caddo word. Now, if we jump a few hundred years down the historical line, we eventually come to the first American immigrants into Texas. You know, the Texicans, Stephen Austin and Sam Houston, and Davy Crockett and all those cats. And they take the Spanish word, the kingdom of Tejas, and it becomes Texas. Hence, it is the Caddo Nation who names Texas. And I do want to point out that the Caddo Nation was treated very shabbily by Texas. And it is the great shame of Texas that the people who gave Texas its name were ultimately forced out of the state in the 19th century. Very shameful. All right. And indeed, I think some kind of restitution is likely needed. At any rate, uh, one of the more really striking things about the Caddo is their incredible artwork, their incredible ceramic art. And if you look right up above me, this is the ancient ceramic art of the Caddo. Absolutely beautiful, absolutely stunning designs, bottles, bore, gourds, vases, jars, just breathtakingly beautiful art. This is the literally the original art of Texas. I mean, after all, they did name the place. And it is absolutely spectacular, even by the really high standards of, of Mississippian civilization. Caddo ceramics are absolutely incredible. And one of the more incredible stories about the Caddo nation is how modern Caddo people sat down with anthropologists, with historians, with archaeologists, and they rebirthed the Caddo artistic tradition, mostly led by this genius woman there on the upper left, Jerry Redcorn. They recreated, they figured out and reverse engineered how to make these Caddo vessels, how to make these breathtakingly beautiful ceramic vessels. And you can see right up above me, the ancient vessels, the ancient ceramics, and there at the bottom, the modern ceramics produced by modern Caddo artists. And uh, they're absolutely beautiful. Uh, there on the lower left, that's a piece by Chase Earls. I would love to own a piece by Chase Earls, but I can't afford it. I'm just a teacher. That's a that's a $5,000 ceramic piece right there. It's absolutely beautiful. So this is the real original art of Texas. You literally can't get more Texas than the Caddo. Now we're going to change our focus a little bit. We're going to move to the east and to the north. Above these Mississippian kingdoms, you have scattered in the woodlands of the Ohio Valley, of the Great Lakes, of the St. Lawrence Valley, of the place we are going to call New England, the Eastern Woodlands Nations. Now, when I originally taught this lecture, I said, oh, these are the, the, society, the nations of the Iroquois and the Algonquin, and that caused students no end of problems, uh, because no one can spell Iroquoian and Algonquin. So... With much apologies to the Iroquois and Algonquin nations, for the purposes of this class, we're simply going to call them the Eastern Woodlands Nations. My apologies. Now, these guys were primarily farmers, or I should say, uh, these gals were primarily farmers. Uh, they lived, those are the, there's a rough map of the uh, Woodlands Nations right up above me. They spoke uh, basically two family groups, the Iroquoian languages and Algonquin languages, with sort of a smaller number of Siouan languages to the west, 
that's more or less what they looked like in the upper left. But of course, if we're talking about pre-Columbian times, uh, they didn't have rifles or muskets. Uh, they were armed uh, with basically stone-tipped uh, arrows. Now, the Algonquin and Iroquoian nations themselves did not live in sort of big walled towns like the Mississippian kingdoms, but rather in fortified villages. Fortified villages that looked pretty much like that. So you would have this wooden palisade around the village and these long houses inside the village itself. That's what one of the long houses looked like. And inside each long house, you would, would live one or two extended families. Now around the uh, fortified village, would have there would be cornfields where they would grow the three sisters. But again, with a corn-based diet, you must supplement it with animal flesh. So the uh, Eastern Woodlands nations were really obsessed with hunting grounds, really obsessed with hunting grounds. And every so often, every dozen years or so, it was not uncommon uh, for the Woodlands nations to simply abandon one fortified village and simply move to another on another part of the, of the river valley or, you know, one mountain over. So they, they moved around. They were much more mobile uh, than the sort of, you know, walled towns of the Mississippians. Now, among these Iroquoian and Algonquin groups, uh, gender roles were very, very strict. Uh, and this actually is, plays a really important role in the relations between the English and the Native Americans. That the Eastern Woodland nations had very strict gender roles. And it weren't, went basically like this. The men did not farm. Men generally, they went into the hunting preserves, they went into the woods, they hunted and went to war against the enemy nations. That's what men did. They would leave for weeks at a time, and then come back with deer or beaver or elk or bear or, you know, the heads of their enemies. Uh, farming was women's work, and it was considered very effeminate for a man to actually farm. And this is going to cause a lot of conflict with the English uh, when the English land in Virginia in the 17th century, and when they land in New England uh, further north in that to the English, the central masculine role was a farmer and nothing made you more masculine than being able to farm. But to the Indians, this was absolutely laughable. They would literally sit there and watch these Englishmen like working in the fields, like growing corn. <laughs> like, like they were like, the, why are you doing women's work? Why don't you just put on a ball gown and lipstick? To the, uh, to the Eastern Woodlands nations, farming is like incredibly effeminate. Like, why would they do that? So when, they, when we start talking about English Native American relations, like the Indians do not treat the Englishmen very well because they don't see them as real men. But the reverse is also true. The Englishmen would come visit the Eastern Woodlands villages and they would basically see the picture right up above. All the women working hard and the few men that were there kind of sitting around, smoking tobacco, relaxing, maybe slowly getting drunk and playing with their kids. And the idea was, what? These guys are so incredibly lazy. They let their women work while they just sit around all day. But again, this is, this is clashing with what's going on culturally. Because again, for the Eastern Woodlands Nation, the masculine role was to hunt and go to war. When the men were actually working, they were off in the woods. They weren't in the village. The only people that you saw in the village were either the very old men or the people who'd just come back from these really extended, you know, hunting trips where they would be gone for two or three weeks at a time, come back with all this meat that was absolutely needed. So the only men that the Englishmen would see in the Indian village were basically the guys who were relaxing because they, they'd just been working constantly for, you know, 20 days. So this causes a lot of cultural clash and the Englishmen don't respect the Indians because they view them as, as just lazy, letting the women work. Uh, so you have this kind of cultural clash about gender roles, which leads to lots of problems. Now, here's a very important role though. These gender roles extended even to sacred, special, magical plants. And because while women themselves grew the corns, the beans, and the squash, only certain special women sacred women could farm the most valuable plant of them all, wild tobacco. And you see there, there on the upper left, you know, an Indian woman 
farming tobacco and giving some tobacco to the man who just wants to smoke and relax because he's probably been hunting for like a month. So the women hunted, no, the women farmed, the men hunted, and the special sacred women grew wild tobacco. That is going to play a key role to a theory about Jamestown that we're going to see in another section. Now, they did go to war. Uh, the Eastern Woodland Nations almost warred almost constantly with their neighbors, but they fought different types of wars. The Eastern Woodlands Nations, the Iroquoian and the Algonquin Nations, they did not fight these brutal wars of annihilation. Generally, their wars consisted of these kind of ambuscades and raids and hit-and-run strikes on their enemy. And one type of, of military conflict that they would get into was called mourning wars. And here's the really interesting thing about mourning wars. Uh, that the mourning wars are not really fought over territory. Mourning wars are not really fought to kind of annihilate your enemy, but rather they are fought for three very distinct reasons that are going to sound absolutely bizarre until you think about it. One, mourning wars, as you can probably tell by the name, were fought to mourn the death of a really powerful individual. A clan mother passes on, a great shaman dies, uh, you know, a war leader is killed in battle, and the nation would mourn them. And one of the ways you honor someone's memory is by declaring a war dedicated to them, all right? Grandma dies, she's the great clan mother. To honor grandmother, we are gonna go kill a bunch of our enemy. And then a bunch of us go out into the woods. The second reason that the morning wars were primarily fought was, you can see it on the left, child snatching. Uh, one of the principal goals of morning wars was to snatch children. Uh, these, these Iroquois and Algonquin nations, the Eastern Woodlands nations, one of their targets during this warfare were children of their enemies. And in fact, they would attack their enemy, kill them, take their children, bring them back to their village, back to their nation, and raise the child as their own. They did this constantly. And this seems very, very strange to us, and it seemed really bizarre to the English. But this, they did this all the time, and they would make, you know, they wouldn't lie to the child. They wouldn't, like, pretend that that was their biological child, but rather they would say things like, if your parents really loved you, they would have defended you. I loved you even more because I was willing to kill for you and bring you back to where you really belong, which is with my people, all right? So they would, the, you know, the Iroquois would attack the Huron and raise Huron children as the Iroquois. The Wampanoag would attack the Narragansetts and raise the Narragansett children as Wampanoag. Uh, and they would do this constantly. And when the Indians go to war against the English, they snatch English children and raise them as Indians. And that's, of course, it sort of ties in with the first, uh, with the first reason, that to mourn the dead. You know, grandma dies. She's the great clan mother. We go to war and we get her a couple of new grandkids. Yeah. Um, and it was, it was seen as, 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 great honor, as a great honor to earn the love of your child, not just through biological means, but through warfare. But the third reason behind a morning war is the most important one of them all. And that's what's, that's what's right up above me. The point of morning wars, the most important part of a morning war, was hunting rights. The right to take deer from certain parts of the woods. The Eastern Woodlands nations didn't have the big hunting preserves that the Mississippian kingdoms had, but rather they had this huge wooded area and only certain people were allowed to hunt in certain parts of the forest. So you would go to war against your enemy nation, defeat them, hold a conference, you would sit around literally smoking a peace pipe and say, okay, we will end the war, uh, but you are not allowed to hunt south of this river, or you are not allowed to hunt on that mountain. Okay, and in this way, successful tribes increased their hunting, increased their hunting grounds, and increased the amount of meat coming back to their village. Defeated groups lost the right to hunt in certain areas, had less meat, and would get sicker over time. And indeed, the largest and most dramatic uh, 
uh, of these uh, morning wars where the beaver wars themselves, where the Iroquois Confederation claims the entire Great Lakes as their hunting grounds. But we'll see that in just a bit. So the morning wars were primarily fought for three reasons. To mourn the dead, to get new children, to just to snatch children, and three, to establish hunting rights, to build hunting rights across different areas of the woodlands. Now, there were scores of these nations. In fact, there might have been upwards of a hundred different eastern woodlands nations, and, and I, of course, can't talk about all of them. I'm really only going to focus on the ones that are really distinct or historically important or really large and powerful. And one of the largest and most powerful of the eastern woodlands nations was the Powhatan Imperial Confederacy, led by a single paramount chief, or a king, uh, as the English called him. Uh, they called him King Powhatan, but in the 17th century, his name is Waham Seneca. Now, the Powhatan themselves were an imperial chiefdom. So it was a single ruler and a large number of villages which paid tribute to him. And in return, he provided security and protected them from their very avaricious neighbors. And the Powhatan Confederacy itself often had enemies. In fact, it was surrounded by very rapacious enemies. The Chesapeake Indians to the north, their enemies in the western mountains. They had even more enemies, you know, down south. The Powhatan Confederacy was large and important, but it was also surrounded by enemies and in a very delicate position, which is one of the reasons they actually welcomed the English there in 1607. And the Powhatan inhabited uh, almost all of eastern Virginia, a land that they called Senecomacau. And we're going to meet the Powhatan. In fact, the Powhatan are going to get very important when the first English show up in the 17th century. However, a polity that dwarf the Powhatan. I mean, the Powhatan are really big and are important, but they're the most powerful nation on the eastern seaboard. But the most powerful eastern woodlands nation of them all was the Iroquois Confederation. They called themselves, of course, the Haudenosaunee, the people of the Longhouse. Now, the Iroquois Confederation was not a single nation, but rather it was a union of five nations the Mohawk, the Oneida, the Onondaga, the Cayuga, and the Seneca. And later in their history, they add a, a sixth nation to them, uh, the Tuscarora. And they inhabited the area that we call today upstate New York, uh, the you know, Hudson Valley, uh, the area around Lake Ontario, and the upper St. Lawrence River. And they lived in these very dense fortified villages, like the kind you can see right up above, in these big longhouses that would hold you know, several extended families in and among them. And the Iroquois Confederation was the largest, the most aggressive, and the most powerful of all the Iroquoian, of all uh, the Algonquin nations. Everyone respected the Iroquois Confederation, and everyone feared the most powerful nation within the Iroquois Confederation, the Mohawk. I, look at them. They're absolutely terrifying. Everyone is scared of the Mohawk. No one wants to fight the Iroquois because everyone is scared of the Mohawk. Even the Powhatan really didn't like it when they heard the Mohawk were in the area. Everyone is scared of the Mohawk. And of course, even the modern hairstyle is derived from the terrifying fashions of the great Mohawk warriors themselves. Now, the Iroquois Confederation is formed sometime in the 15th century uh, by a great leader called Hiawatha. And Hiawatha has this huge story where he go, he's thrown out of his own nation and he journeys into the north and he meets this prophet who gives him all these prophecies about how the Iroquois have to stick together. And if they don't, if the five nations don't unify, then they will be destroyed in, in time. So Hiawatha comes south and his family has all been, very bad things have happened to his family. And instead of taking revenge, he says, my people are more important than my desire for revenge. So he makes peace among these five uh, Indian nations and has them join together into the Iroquois Confederation. And this is why Hiawatha is known as the great peacemaker, sort of the George Washington of the Iroquois Confederation. There's songs and myths and all these poems about Hiawatha, uh, the great peacemaker. And Hiawatha becomes so entrenched in the oral traditions uh, of the Iroquois that 
uh, his his symbol, his belt of wampum, and I'll explain what that is later. The belt of wampum is there on the upper left. That is the, the belt of wampum of Hiawatha, and that itself later becomes the symbol of the Iroquois Confederation. Now, the Iroquois Confederation worked in a really unusual way, in a way that you wouldn't really expect from Native Americans, but it did. It had a really unusual form of government. Because you see, unlike the Powhatan, which were ruled by a paramount king, a paramount chief, the Iroquois Confederation was a representative democracy, okay? And to make really important decisions, they would meet and have votes. And this was called the Haudenosaunee Grand Council of Chiefs. For instance, let's say the Iroquois Confederation have to make a really tough decision. You know, one of the, one of the sachems, one of the great chiefs, would, would declare that he wants to hold a Haudenosaunee Grand Council. And here's images of the Haudenosaunee, Haudenosaunee Grand Council. The drawing there on the upper left, uh, that is from the 18th century. This is a, a modern reimagining. And this is how the Iroquois government worked. This is how their representative democracy actually worked. Okay, so you had these individual clans inside these villages, and each clan was headed by a clan mother. And the clan mother got to pick the chief. This is really interesting because the greatest man in a village wasn't the person who became chief. It was the person who was selected by the clan mother. So the women would select the chief uh, of, the, of, the, of the clan, of the tribe. And the chief, the sachem, would go to the grand council. And all of the various sachems would meet. So you would have the Onadida sachems over there, the Cayuga sach sachems over there, the Mohawk sachems over there. There's the scary looking guys over there. But the thing is, is that each nation only gets one vote. So they would sit around and each sachem would stand forth. He would hang his belt of wampum uh, uh, on, on, on a frame. And then he would give a great speech arguing that this is the way my nation should vote. This is the way other nations should vote. And they would give a great speech, and then he would sit down, and everyone would, would kind of nod and maybe smoke a little tobacco. And then someone else would stand up and give another speech, either agreeing or disagreeing with him. And at the end of the day, all the nations would get together and have a vote. Five nations. And although each nation had multiple clans within it, each nation only gets one vote, and they have to go the way that the Grand Council votes. And this is why a lot of people have made the argument, and I find it a, a really interesting argument, even though, to be quite honest, the evidence is actually kind of weak. But I, I, I find it a very interesting article, and I find it a compelling argument that the Haudenosaunee Grand Council is an influence on the writing of the U.S. Constitution. That, again, the modern American political system has its roots, or at least at least one root, uh, in Native America. I mean, we know that Benjamin Franklin went to at least one of these Haudenosaunee Grand Council uh, meetings, and the, the, the Grand Council itself operates almost identical to the way that the U.S. Senate does today. So it's a representative democracy where only the men can run for office, but only the women get to vote. Very, very interesting. Uh, a very interesting form of government. Now, you have a sort of picture of Native America in 1491, just before sort of Columbus shows up in the Caribbean. And the Europeans begin to arrive in 1492. And this world that the Native Americans have built begins to shatter. And we'll talk about the shattering of the Native American world in the next section. And I will see you there.